నమస్తే మేడం నమస్తే సాయి గారు బాగున్నారా బాగున్నాను బాగున్నాను రైస్ రీసెర్చ్ లో జాయిన్ అయ్యా అవును ఎవరో చెప్పారు ఈ మధ్య బాగున్నారా మేడం సార్ ఎలాగున్నారు సార్ కూడా బాగున్నారు ఓకే సాయి ప్రసాద్ గారు అక్టోబర్ లో జాయిన్ అక్టోబర్ అక్టోబర్ లో జాయిన్ అయ్యా అక్టోబర్ లో జాయిన్ మీరు అక్కడేనా కందుకూరు కందుకూరే ఓకే ఓకే గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ రెడ్డి గారు వెరీ గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ డాక్టర్ శ్రీనివాసన్ నైస్ టు సీ యూ ఆన్ ది స్క్రీన్ లెట్ అస్ స్టార్ట్ నౌ ఐ థింక్ ఎవ్రీబడి హెస్ జాయిన్ టు ఫ్రమ్ అవర్ ఇన్స్టిట్యూట్ Should, yeah. should we start now, sir? Yeah, it's fine. I mean, uh, I think we are still two minutes behind. So, I mean, if you want to wait, it's fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll wait for another two minutes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Some are uh, still... Uh, 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 సార్ 
Now it's now it's okay. <laughs> okay. Srinivasan, we'll now start the lecture series, okay? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Very good morning to one and all present here. I feel extremely privileged and honored to be given this opportunity to welcome Honorable Deputy Director Generals, Assistant Director Generals from Indian Council of Agricultural Research, Director Central Tobacco Research Institute, Directors of different ICR institutes, Head of the Divisions, Scientists Across India, Scientific Fraternity from CTRI, and other faculty from all the institutes of the nation. As a part of ongoing celebrations of Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, commemorating the 75 years of India's independence, ICR Central Tobacco Research Institute Rajamandri is organizing lecture series. Honorable speaker of this session, Dr. Ancha Srinivasan Sir, Climate Change Advisor and Regional Coordinator, Asian Development Bank, Bangkok, Thailand, kindly accepted to deliver a special lecture on very important topic, agribusiness value chains in a changing climate. This session is chaired by respected chairman and director, ICR CTRI, Dr. D. Damodar Reddy, sir. We are very, very grateful for your glorious presence in this virtual meet here, sir. Now I request our respected director, CTR, uh -huh. Dr. D. Damodar Reddy, sir, to give introduction yeah. of the speaker. Uh -huh. Thank you, Dr. Hema. Uh, very good morning, uh, friends uh, from ICR and other uh, uh, organizations. Uh, very good morning to Dr. Srinivasan, uh, the today's uh, guest and also the invitee speaker. Um, uh, on the important uh, topic of agribusiness agri value chains in uh, changing climate. We all know that um, the Indian Council of Agriculture Research, in, uh, Research is organizing Ajadi Ke Amrit Mahasav to commemorate uh, the 75 years of independence in India. Uh, as part of these lectures, is, uh, we are pleased to uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. Ancha Srinivasan to deliver a, a, a special lecture on uh, climate change, uh, particularly climate change with respect to the agribusiness value chains. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ancha uh, because he is widely known at the international level uh, for his contributions in the international development uh, initiative mm. program. He's mute yourself. Uh, and uh, he is uh, widely known, as I said, uh, he doesn't need uh, much of introduction, but uh, nevertheless, um, some of our young colleagues, budding scientists of this uh, institute, as well as the scientists from other institutes, would like to know about uh, Dr. Ancha Srinivasan. So, Dr. Ancha Srinivasan is a climate change advisor and a regional coordinator for uh, natural resource management at the Southeast Asia Development of the Asian Development Bank. Presently, he is working from uh, Thailand, office of uh, ADB in Bangkok. Dr. Srinivasan, as we all know, is uh, from uh, our state, that is Andhra Pradesh, uh, especially from uh, Bodapadu village of uh, Gumpur district. And uh, he is uh, very much known among uh, among all his uh, friends, colleagues, for his academic credentials. He has uh, maintained uh, impeccable academic record in uh, both schooling as well as in uh, college uh, education. He, as we all know, but he, is, uh, he, he has obtained his uh, bachelor's degree from Andhra Pradesh Agriculture University, uh, then uh, Master's degree from uh, from uh, uh, Indian Agriculture Research Institute in and specialized in agronomy. 
and uh, he went on to get the doctoral degree from uh, Cambridge University and uh, he is uh, he's the one uh, who stood first uh, and also got the gold medal uh, for his master's thesis and also got the letter of appreciation from the prime minister of india for receiving volume for receiving uh, the highly competent to cambridge university doctoral fellowship and that uh, shows the, the 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 kind of meritorious and the talent uh, that he has shown exhibited uh, during his college and uh, schooling days dr srinivasan has uh, volume dr srinivasan has uh, more than 30 years of experience and expertise in uh, multidisciplinary research as well as international development programs he has uh, built and monitor, uh, mentored multidisciplinary teams in project conceptualization design implementation and evaluation as climate change focal point for uh, about 10 countries in uh, southeast asia he is uh, instrumental in uh, implementation of many projects uh, uh, to address climate change impacts and their mitigation in uh, important sectors like agribusiness, water resources, energy transport, and urban development. As chairman of the ADP Climate Smart Agriculture Working Group, he has been serving as uh, ADP's local for the forest investment program, stakeholder engagement in climate investment funds, and as uh, ADP's alternate focal for pilot program on climate resilience. Dr. Srinivasan uh, helped uh, many developing countries, particularly in Asia, to mobilize funds for climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation programs. And uh, the worth of such fund mobilization uh, has exceeded uh, more than $2 billion. And that shows the kind of uh, um, interest he has got in uh, creating the uh, climate of uh, managing the climate change uh, for its adaptation and uh, mitigation. Dr. Anja had worked in uh, uh, several important uh, international institutions, organizations, uh, like uh, Institute for Global Environment Strategies, Japan, Japan International Research Center for Agriculture Sciences, and International Crops Research Institute for Semi-Arid Tropics, Ikrishat. And he has made a lot of contributions to the uh, to, to, to the international initiatives such as Intergovernmental Panel uh, on uh, Climate Change, IPCC, Global Environmental Outlook, Millennium Ecosystems Assessment, and the System for Analysis, Research, and Training. He has uh, uh, been known for his uh, editorial skills. He has uh, edited a lot of a large number of books, including Climate Smart Development in Asia, Handbook of Precision Agriculture, Low Carbon Transport in Asia, and uh, is also author of uh, more than 90 peer-reviewed peer publications. He serves as the member of the large number of editorial boards of several uh, scientific journals, he received many awards and honors, including Isaku Sato Memorial Foundation Prize of uh, United Nations University, and Dr. Ancha. Uh, has made uh, his presence felt uh, in more uh, more than the countries by making uh, exquisite presentations on the contemporary research and development uh, issues at various international conferences. With this uh, rich uh, biography, uh, today we are lucky to have uh, Dr. Ancha with us uh, for uh, his uh, presentation on uh, agribusiness value chains in changing climate. And uh, I hope uh, with this presentation, all the participants are going to be sensitized and they will be getting a lot of insights into, into agribusiness value chains, particularly in the era of climate change. With this uh, introduction, I formally request Dr. Ancha to uh, make a presentation. Now the floor is yours. Dr. Ancha, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Damar. Damodar Reddy, uh, sir, I mean, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. I will now make my presentation and I will try to share my screen. Just one minute. <laughs> Oh, the... Right. It's negative, but uh, symptoms are similar. 
I request all the participants to please mute yourself. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much again for your kind introduction. I'm very happy to uh, actually make this a short presentation on an important topic, agribusiness value chains in a changing climate. So I would like to request the participants to mute your microphones because uh, if there is disturbance, it's really difficult. Okay, uh, in this presentation, I will briefly touch upon Asian Development Bank's support for agriculture, and then also provide some context for the agribusiness value chains and climate change. And then I will talk about how do we transform this agribusiness value chains in a changing climate and conclude with a few case studies uh, that where ADB is uh, trying to support for this transformation. As uh, you're all working very hard in terms of uh, conducting research across various institutes in Indian Council of Agricultural Research, I thought it is also good to identify a few research gaps uh, for your further work. And then I will conclude. Again, I would like to request all the colleagues who are not speaking kindly mute your microphones. Asian Development Bank about three years ago has developed a strategy 2030 and it has seven operational priorities. And the fifth priority is focusing on rural development and food security. The first priority is addressing the remaining poverty and reducing inequalities across Asia, accelerating progress in gender equality, tackling climate change, building climate, climate and disaster resilience, and enhancing environmental sustainability. ADB aspires to become Asia's climate bank. To, that, uh, make, to make it happen, I mean, it has committed that at least 75% of its operations will address climate change by 2030. Hello. And we would also like to provide $100 billion from its own resources, not from the co-financing, uh, from 2019 to 2030. We also have other priorities like strengthening governance and institutional capacity and fostering regional cooperation and integration. There are three key approaches. Uh, in all these uh, seven operational priorities, we would like to expand our private sector operations so that at least one third of ADV operations by 2024 will be private sector oriented. And also we'd like to catalyze and mobilize more financial resources for development. For every $1 in private sector operations financing, we would like to mobilize $2.5 of co-financing. And of course, we, we would also strive to become a knowledge bank by strengthening knowledge services. Coming to this operational priority, focusing on agriculture, there are three strategic operational priorities. One is on rural development, second is on agricultural value chains, and third is on food security. There are several uh, operational approaches that are highlighted here. I will not read out. Uh, this presentation will also be circulated to people who are interested uh, to receive it later. So I only highlighted a few things that you can look at. One of the issues is the competitive agribusiness value chains. When we say competitiveness, we are looking at the five parameters. It is productivity, resilience, safety and quality, value addition, and improved rural household incomes. So we'd like to ensure that our agribusiness value chains are competitive in, across Asia Pacific. And of course, more importantly, we would like to focus more on food safety and traceability and climate smart agriculture solutions, besides other issues such as rural health, water food health nexus, or knowledge intensive agriculture, et cetera. Although there is a separate operational strategy for agriculture, there are close linkages for the remaining operational strategies of ADB. Uh, the first operational strategy on addressing poverty 
For example, we would like to build community climate resilience at uh, rural or rural areas pr primarily. That includes farmers, uh, women, and others. And in terms of the operational priority number three on climate change, we would like to scale up climate smart agricultural technologies to produce more food with less water and energy and labor. And in terms of operational priority number two, in terms of uh, gender equality, we would like to ensure that equal access to women farmers are provided in terms of productive assets, financing, and technologies. And operational priority number four, making cities more liberal, livable, we would like to contribute to urban food security. This is one area where India also needs to emphasize more. Uh, peri-urban farming, vertical farming within uh, urban areas, etc. And in terms of institutional capacity, we would like to look at uh, supporting more farmer groups and cooperatives for agribusiness operations, integrating farmers in agribusiness value chains, promoting public-private partnership models, etc. And in terms of regional cooperation and integration, by providing connectivity through transport corridors, we would like to invest more on agri logistics, marketing, digital technologies, and e-commerce. So for this to happen, ADB offers a menu of financial instruments. They range from project lending, balance of payment lending, policy-based lending, multi-tranche financing facility, results-based lending, sector lending, or sector development programs. So there are a wide range of financial instruments available for various countries, I mean, depending on the interests. In addition, we also provide emergency assistance loans, project design advance loans, additional financing, and also mobilize co-financing. In addition, we provide grants mainly through technical assistance for preparing the projects and also for providing knowledge support. ADB support for agriculture is not that significant compared to other sectors like energy and transport, urban development, water, sanitation, supplies, etc. About 6% of the ADB's annual investments out of $30 to $35 billion per year uh, goes to agriculture. So as you can see here, average around $2 billion per year. So in terms of total ADB's uh, $32 billion per year, it is rather small, but we would like to increase more in terms of agribusiness value chain operations. And also we are increasing our climate finance investments in agriculture. So gradually, currently it's around 400 to $500 million per year. And we'd like to make it to $1 billion per year over time, actually by 2024. When we say climate change adaptation, I mean, it could be in terms of improving climate resilient varieties, livestock breeds, improving irrigation methods, alternate wetting and drying and other methods that contribute to climate resilience. And also in terms of uh, mitigation also, there are many opportunities, both in terms of energy, transport, renewable energy or sustainable waste management, etc. So why this topic of agribusiness value chains in a changing climate is important. Agribusiness actually directly impacts eight out of 17 sustainable development goals. And we believe that sustainable development goals one, two, 12, 13, and 15 may be impossible to achieve if we do not transform our agribusiness operations by 2030. And we also are conscious of the projections you know, our population is increasing by 2050, maybe we will be 9 or 10 billion uh, people, so 30% increase. But at the same time, we are expected to have water deficits of almost 25%. And the arable land per person is going to decrease by 20%. And at the same time, because of climate change, there will be almost reduction of 10 to 15% decrease. On one hand, we have to increase the production to meet the increasing population. On the other hand, climate change is going to impact in terms of decreasing crop yields. And it could be as high as 50% for some crops. So this is the dilemma that we are facing. And this is very important for all of us in working in ICR. And another part, part is that currently our agribusiness value chains are very fragmented and resource inefficient. 
we all know that farmers share in the consumers dollar is very low in mm. india for example out of 1 dollar that is paid by the consumers maybe the farmer is getting around less than 10 cents but in developed countries it ranges from 40 to 60 cents so how can we really increase the farmer share in consumers dollar that is very critical and similarly our post harvest losses in india or even other developing countries are very high ranging from 30 to 50 percent we all know cases of tomato in andhra pradesh or i mean many crops for that matter all over india and in developed countries such losses are around 10 percent but in our countries it is at 30 to 50 percent and simultaneously our agribusiness operations are also contributing to high carbon footprint because of so many inefficiencies across the value chain and we have a moral responsibility also in terms of inclusivity the agribusiness value chains and dependence on agriculture our 84 percent of the agricultural holdings are small farms less than two percent hectare two hectares and 50 percent of the workforce are women of course this may vary with each country but in general these are uh, across asia and another trend that we all know is the, the farmers are aging and there is also diminishing interest of youth in farming so unless we make farming more attractive to youth by really improving the commercialization aspects and also real real income income generation opportunities youth are not going to come into agriculture and obviously this will have serious implications for future sustainability and also we observed widening disparity in income opportunities between rural and urban areas and growing consumer concerns on food safety and quality and this is again a common problem i mean because our agri business value chains are not paying enough attention for food safety and quality and there are also internationally speaking there are unpaid terms of regional and international trade for agricultural products produced in developing countries and we all know that there is also worsening food security. Uh, this is between 2010 to 2020 undernourishment trends. As you can see, this is just a overview. Basically, we are not making improvements overall. The undernourishment is still increasing. If you look at the India, still we have 17% of the population still with insufficient food consumption. Uh, last year, for example, in COVID times in between April and July. This is a survey done by World Food Program. So in these modern times, to say that our almost one quarter, I mean, one fifth of our population is still doesn't have insufficient food, food means it is something we all need to ponder after 70 years of independence. So same thing in relation to key driving factors of food insecurity. I mean, not only in terms of climate change, but there are several economic shocks and poverty link. This is the World Food Program. I mean, basically here developing member countries uh, in Asia with at least two drivers of uh, contributing to food insecurity are identified. As you can see, most of our Asian countries are already covered. And now because of COVID and also other factors, the world, I mean, if you have food price index is at, at highest level, what does this mean actually? As I mentioned in my earlier slide, already 20% of the people or 17% of the people are not getting enough food to eat. So they will continue to suffer because of the high uh, food prices. So these are the current causes of recent food price hike. One is a higher oil price, extreme weather events, higher feed demand for the livestock sector, COVID-19 related supply, uh, supply chain disruptions, and also macroeconomic policies. All these are contributing to a recent food price hike. How are we really making our agribusiness value chains to cope with these uh, uh, changes is important to think about. So we only have eight years or nine years to go towards 2030 and we are not on track to meet sustainable development goals that were decided in 2015. Without transformation of agribusinesses and hunger and malnutrition are going to persist even beyond 2030 with the current business as usual scenarios. 
So that is why we all believe that there is a strong need for building resilience and sustainability of agri-food systems. And from that point of view, agribusiness value change, uh, whether it is input supply or consumers, all these favor an important role in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, building that resilience and sustainability. I mean, these are some of the disruptions caused due to COVID-19. I mean, in the past two years, and our agriculture is also contributing to several environmental health consequences. We all know that agriculture uses almost 70% of the water resources and 50% of habitable land. And agriculture also accounts for so much of biodiversity loss. And we also identify you know, several diseases that are occurring now and contributing to also greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. So if we look at our own continent, Asia tops the list in terms of, it is called most vulnerable to climate change. 10, of the, 10 out of top 16 most vulnerable countries are in Asia, and that includes India. So international negotiators and climate change discussions, they agreed that uh, we should limit global warming to ideally to one A marginal 0.5 degrees centigrade. So, a recently, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has come up with a report. What are the differences? So, if you look at the species loss with just 0.5 degree raise in temperature, the plants that lose at least half of their range for production, almost two times worsening, you know, with 0.5 degrees raise. In temperature, we are going. So not coming. Why is not coming? Sir, it is disconnected. Please wait for five minutes, sir.
Can anybody explain the activities in India now by UDB? Hello, Ramana sir, a speaker is yet to join, sir. He has to complete the presentation. After that, we will have interaction. What time can anybody continue? Yes, sir, he is joining, sir. In two minutes, he is joining. First, let us complete his presentation, sir. After that, we'll have interaction. Okay, okay. Okay, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. Srinivasan, okay. sir. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I mean, sir. can you hear me well? Yes, sir. One minute. Sorry for this trouble. Hey? No problem, sir. Please carry on, sir. Okay. Just a minute. Sorry for the trouble. Uh, something happened. Okay. Yes, I mean, I was explaining that uh, what is the uh, significance of even 0.5 degrees centigrade. And same thing applies to crop yields and even the decline in marine fisheries, etc. So with just 0.5 degrees, the losses can be almost twice. So that is why we should be very uh, careful. I mean, when we are looking at the increasing temperatures. So this is a World Development Report from World Bank. I mean, basically it says that uh, the climate change impacts on crop yields will be uh, very serious across the world and more so in Asia and Pacific. And if you look at the Asia, or irrigated rice in Asia, which is an important crop, uh, the prediction by ADB and IFPRI, International Food Policy Research Institute, suggests that there could be a decrease of minus 27% uh, uh, if, if we are just uh, continuing the business as usual scenario. So that is why it shows that we need to really adapt and improve our, uh, our crop production systems. And however, I mean, the perceptions on the vulnerability to climate change across the value chain also differ. Uh, this is a study done by CSIRO in Australia. There they mentioned the farmers, for example, they feel that the 58% of the farmers are already feeling that they are high. So the perception of climate change varies actually. This is one thing that we all need to do, uh, look at even within India, across the value chain, how different segments of uh, consumers or producers are real. Better man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
The host can uh, control the mute, unmute, uh, and uh, only accept the speaker. Again, it is disconnected. I request all the participants to have little patience and please wait. Internet problem is there from speaker side. So I request all the participants to please wait for five more minutes. Let us have patience. So there are The host can control the unmute facility by themselves. Go to settings.
Sir, uh, the uh, connection is uh, either it is uh, phone connection is established with the speaker, sir. It, uh, so it's okay. Otherwise, can somebody others who are having some uh, knowledge in the topic can contribute? Uh, meanwhile, still connection is restored. Yeah, just a minute. <laughs> ah, okay. Yes. Uh, actually, connection is restored, but uh, can can you make the can you project the presentation there? I mean, okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Can, can you just uh, thumbs up? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, sorry for this trouble. I don't know why. This is the uh, first time it happened. The, um, yeah, please, next slide, please. Yes, I mean, here I am trying to explain that the perceptions of uh, various uh, stakeholders along the value chain vary. And for each value chain, it is important for us to assess actually how they perceive climate change. Then only we can really conceive a pro proper action. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, our agribusiness value chains also contribute to substantial greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, if you look at the sector, it's almost like 24%. Of course, the estimates vary from anywhere between 18 to 29%. But on an average, we can say a quarter is coming from agriculture and food sector or forestry sector. So next, please. So within agriculture, forestry and land use, as you can see, uh, most of it is from the livestock sector. Enteric uh, fermentation, about 40%. And manure left on pasture about 16%, synthetic fertilizers about 13%, paddy rice uh, contributes around 10%, and manure management 7%, etc. So basically, our agribusiness operations are substantial contributors to global greenhouse gases, uh, also. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an analysis done sometime in 2015 by us. Uh, basically, if we really want to uh, go for agribusiness as, as usual, obviously this uh, agriculture sector itself will have almost 70% of the total emissions uh, by 2030. So if we really want to target that 1.5 degrees centigrade or 2 degrees centigrade, uh, kindly look at this uh, uh, last sentence by 2050, agriculture will have to reduce its emissions intensity by 60%. And this is a big challenge actually for developing countries uh, to happen. So we need uh, innovative mechanisms. Next slide, please. So how do we really transform our agribusiness value chains in a changing climate? And here I would like to briefly touch upon what do we mean by transformation? Transformation is basically we are talking about strategic changes in the targeted value chains and systems with large scale sustainable impacts that can shift or accelerate the trajectory 
towards inclusive, prosperous, safe, nutritious, and resilient agribusiness development. So there are so many adjectives there, as you can see, inclusive, prosperous, safe, nutritious, and resilient. And this is something, I mean, the transformation is going to achieve if we do it right. So transformational change also, it will catalyze further changes across the system. And we need, it needs to enable a state shift in state from one state to another. And there are four dimensions to be considered. One is in terms of relevance to our national strategies or international strategies, scale, systemic change, and sustainability. These are four dimensions that we should consider. And there are also three signals for transformation. Where are we? Uh, there are early signals, mainly in terms of creating enabling environment. Interim signals, the change is underway, but the outcomes are not yet clear. And there are advanced signals. So when we are looking at agribusiness value chains, a certain agribusiness value chains may be at a higher advanced signal, but some may be at very early signal. So we need to differentiate our approaches uh, depending on the signal or in terms of maturity of the transformation across the value chain. We believe that there are at least four pathways to achieve agribusiness value chain transformation. This could be institutional, where fostering the political will to act and developing a sub-regional or national agribusiness value chain strategy and mobilizing the interest of the ministries of finance or commerce or planning on agribusiness value chain transformation. And another pathway is in terms of promoting policies, uh, which are like a sound public-private partnership and also incentives for private sector investment in agribusiness value chains. And we can also achieve transformation through technolo technological means, whether it is digital technology or other advanced technologies. And fourth area is to change the behavior of the value chain actors. And when we say value chain actors, it could be private sector, it could be farming communities or anyone. So how do we really transform the behavior? So it could be through financial innovation, such as matching grant scheme for small businesses, or digitization of the agribusiness platforms, etc. Next slide, please. Here, uh, now I will go to some case studies. I will talk about uh, some of the projects that I, I, I developed and uh, still being implemented. Uh, one is the climate friendly agribusiness value chain sector project. Uh, this is a, a multi country project in three countries, actually, Cambodia, Lao PDR, and Myanmar. And this is also multi-partner. Uh, in addition to ADB, we received assistance from the Green Climate Fund and also Global Agriculture and Food Security Program. The ADB provided about $171 million loan, while Green Climate Fund provided about $10 million loan and $30 million grant. And in addition, Global Agriculture and Food Security Program provided about $22 million grant. So we are looking at uh, basically improving the competitiveness of rice, maize, cassava, and mango in Cambodia, rice and vegetables in Lao PDR, rice pulses, oil seeds, and beans in, in Myanmar. Next slide, please. So here, the basic objective, as I mentioned, our intention is to improve the agricultural competitiveness as reflected by productivity, resilience, quality, and safety, value addition, and rural household incomes. And there are three critical outputs. One is to make the infrastructure along the value chains to be more climate resilient, and also to enhance capacity of the stakeholders on climate smart agriculture and agribusiness, and also pro promote uh, enabling environment for climate friendly agribusiness. Next slide, please. Yeah, I, I think uh, there is a video on this one developed, but uh, I think for uh, a shortage of time, we can skip that and maybe we can do later. So one of the financial innovations in this project that I just took an example is in Myanmar. This is Agricultural Digital Finance Service. So here we are providing about $5 million grant, actually. The intention is to support 35,000 smallholders and really looking at uh, what we are trying to do is that uh, the microfinance institutions in Myanmar are charging around 30%. And here the intention is to provide a debit card to the farmers uh, up to $300. And they will only be used, uh, allowed to use the debit card 
from quality input service providers actually whether it is agrochemicals or seeds or fertilizers or uh, farm mechanization services etc so here we are trying to identify a bank that will host this grant and the intention is that the bank which will be competitively selected will need to provide three times from their own uh, money because we are giving this $5 million as like a compensating balance. So in case a farmer actually defaults in terms of loan repayment, uh, the bank can rely on this compensating balance fund. So in a one way, it serves as a credit guarantee. So the intention is that uh, the farmers will only use the quality inputs. They will get the uh, credit at a lower interest rate and at the same time, uh, banks also have a considerable interest in providing loans because already ADB is providing some credit guarantee. So this is one of the innovations. And we also have a similar innovation called matching grant scheme, where we have a cluster approach between agribusiness and also farmers. Agribusiness has to commit to provide some services, whether it is a climate resilient seeds or other services, in return, we can provide up to 40% or even 50% grant. Uh, and also they need to commit that they will uh, promote good manufacturing practices and climate friendly practices, whether it is in terms of energy management, waste management in rice mills, for example, uh, like that. That is another innovative scheme that we are trying. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is, uh, next one is, uh, this is on a private sector project uh, we are providing a loan to Olam International in Singapore. And here again, about $175 million and $3 million of TA, directly benefiting about 20,000 farmers in four countries. Here again, I mean, Indonesia, Timor Leste, and uh, uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, mainly looking at various crops like coffee, cocoa, sugar, uh, cashew, and pepper, et cetera. So uh, the intention I gave this example is that uh, one is the one way is to support to the public sector. I mean, the government sovereign operations. Another is directly lending to the private sector. So the ADB operates bo uh, in both ways. Next slide, please. I will be quick here. I mean, uh, we have a similar project on Maharashtra Agribusiness Network. Uh, here, the objective is to assist about 200,000 farmers in terms of uh, building the farmer organizations and also financial support for the value chain operators and also cold chain facilities, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. The case study four is uh, looking at the livestock. Uh, this is another uh, cross-border livestock uh, health and value chains improvement project for about $280 million. Uh, here we are looking at the improving of uh, actually to promote not only regional cooperation and regional health security in terms of uh, uh, not only animal health, actually it contributes to One Health. Where, what is One Health? One Health is the interaction between animal health, plant health, uh, human health, and also environmental health. So we are looking at all the four dimensions in this project. Uh, so that is why we label it as a One Health project. So here, we are, the intention is to reduce the risk from the transboundary animal diseases and also zoonotic diseases. As you know, about 70% of the uh, diseases that are actually affecting human beings are zoonotic, uh, emerging diseases. And another important factor is antimicrobial uses. You know, in livestock industry, we all know that we are using excessive antimicrobials. And that is actually coming into human systems also. So that is why, I mean, we are continuously using more and more antimicrobial. So we would like to address this issue of antimicrobial resistance also through this project. And uh, yeah, and here again, I mean, we'd like to look at the value chain infrastructure for livestock and also improving the capacities and enabling policies. Next slide, please. Case study number five. Okay, I can skip. I mean, basically in the livestock, uh, we are looking at various uh, opportunities for reducing the uh, greenhouse gases as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so I think uh, maybe I can uh, uh, skip this slide in, in a way that basically I talked about. There are four levels, institutional, policy level, technological, and behavioral uh, approaches for transforming agribusiness value chains. Uh, maybe next slide, please. 
and then in terms of the private sector contribution also we are providing a loan to genex animal health india private limited and here again we are looking at uh, how uh, the company can really help in educating the farmers not to use too many antibiotics uh, so this is a, another one health project uh, supporting the private sector uh, next please uh, this is on sustainable coastal and marine fisheries project. Uh, here again, I mean, our intention is to look at the uh, fisheries value chain to be more climate resilient through innovative financing mechanisms such as marine financing facility and also using advanced technologies like remote sensing and uh, in collaboration with the European Space Agency, etc. And our intention is to ensure that uh, the coastal ecosystems are protected, mangroves are protected, and so that the fisheries can be uh, sustainably harvested. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is another example of the dragon fruit value chain in Vietnam. Uh, currently, the intention is to look at the application of digital technologies to improve the uh, value chain operations uh, from dragon fruit uh, harvest and all the way to marketing and processing, etc. So, so I, I think uh, in view of uh, time constraints, I will skip this. Uh, maybe we'll go next slide, please. So these are some of the key takeaways. Uh, I would like to say that agricultural productivity and natural resource management efficiency, we need to increase by 50 to 70 percent. This is a tall order uh, given, given, the, uh, given the current capacities and uh, circumstances in various countries. And the climate change is expected to reduce agricultural productivity by 15 to 20% or even by 50% in some crops by 2050. We also learned that there is agribusiness is a major contributor for global greenhouse gas emissions. And if we really want to achieve the goals of Paris Agreement, we need to reduce emissions from the agri-food sector by nearly 60%. This is also a big challenge to achieve. So we need to promote more climate smart agribusinesses. And basically to, it's a triple win solution to raise productivity, reduce vulnerability, and also uh, minimize the growth of greenhouse gas emissions. And the transformation of agribusiness value chains cannot be done by either governments or research institutions. It needs urgent and innovative efforts by governments, development partners, private sector, and, and ultimately we need to help the farming communities. Uh, next slide, please. I have two more slides and just uh, so I just uh, highlighted six research gaps. Actually, they may be uh, useful for your kind consideration uh, in Indian Council of Agricultural Research. One is that in-depth understanding of the impacts of climate change on priority agribusiness value chains. So actually, unfortunately, our um, research work also, unfortunately, so far is on silo based. People are working only on production side or only working on uh, disease control or only working on uh, pest control, et cetera. People are not really looking at the whole value chain uh, in the context. And uh, same thing in, in relation to impacts of climate change also, we need to have that holistic understanding and what type of losses occur along the value chain because of uh, climate change uh, needs to be determined in various uh, agroecological zones. And we also need to look at where are the opportunities and challenges in terms of aligning our agribusiness value chains towards low carbon and climate resilient pathways. And in terms of exploring opportunities for value creation, you know, still in our countries, most of the products are primary raw produce and we are getting so much wasted and value addition opportunities are considerable, but we are not harnessing as much as we should. So we need to really think if we want to reduce the emissions, we want to reduce the carbon footprint, we want to reduce the vulnerability, we really need to focus more on value creation. And we also need to look at the dynamics of the economic and market risks, risks as well as uh, climate risks along the value chains. And uh, more research is also required between the, I mean, on trade-offs between the climate outcomes in terms of mitigation and adaptation, and also other dimensions in terms of poverty reduction, improving the safety and quality and all other uh, aspects. And we also need to understand better in terms of adaptation of the global value chains and the dynamics of impacts in other countries. 
you see the, the because we are all globally interconnected what is happening in other countries in terms of a value chain whether it is pulses or anything so we really need to look at how the other countries are adapting their agricultural value chains and how what type of impacts will be there in on india so this is something we really need to work further uh, final slide please next so these are some of my just five simple conclusions we believe that climate change is already a game changer for agri business development in asia and transformation is very critical to address food security and also meet climate change goals and in order to happen uh, in terms of transformation we need to ensure that climate actions they need to be mainstreamed in all our agricultural development plans policies programs and projects and the digitalization is an important uh, tool actually to accelerate the transformation of the agri business value chains and it can benefit both producers and consumers actually and covid 19 actually showed lot of uh, that importance uh, the digital usage of technology is actually so it has been useful for both producers and consumers and we need to really encourage that and more importantly we need to promote more innovative business models if we really want to transform our agriculture towards uh, evergreen revolution uh, thank you very much for your patience and i'm sorry again for the connection problems thank you excuse me question thank you sir uh, for the very important lecture and throwing light on uh, various important issues uh, i request participants to kindly interact with sir with the very specific questions um myself uh, i'm i'm ram maruri uh, namaste everyone uh, i'm from uh, lead india foundation uh, we are a global foundation basically we are located in america and uh, uh, globally we are actually having a vision to empower uh, as per the kalam ji's vision uh, in healthcare education environment and agriculture uh, these are the areas uh, kalam ji wanted dr ap j abdul kalam ji our bharat ratna farmer president wanted as uh, to focus and around this youth empowerment women empowerment and economic uh, development and employment generation these are the focus areas for us recently we have um, formed a committee under the leadership of uh, uh, nabard chairman and uh, mentoring us actually to come up with a very good uh, international conference international conference uh, we are working to empower the sustainability in agriculture also we are coming up with uh, in a global innovation challenge in agriculture to innovate and uh, to uh, promote uh, agri entrepreneurs definitely uh, what i heard uh, uh, from um, uh, you know our uh, keynote speaker today srinivasan garu uh, you know, is amazing and uh, we have got so much knowledge and insight uh we we like to definitely um take your uh, input and advisory support for the upcoming uh, webinar international uh, uh, it's not webinar it is a hybrid uh, um session i i don't want to take much time this is not a platform to talk all this but uh, really appreciate the time of all the organizers and our keynote speaker and everyone and especially bujang rao garu who invited me to this and uh, we together work and uh, empower the sustainability in agriculture that is my suggestion to all of you thank you very much thank you thank you sir any other specific questions all participants for and not sent participants anybody if, uh, would like to interact yes myself myself dr sarla from ctr rajmundi sir sir is the adp is there any research projects uh, is funding uh, like uh, value chains related with value chains sir research projects yes i mean uh... the adb does fund research projects also but it's also at the request of the governments that want so the basically adb is owned by governments as you know so the any request for research funding should come 
through the government, usually the Ministry of uh, External Affairs and Ministries of Finance. So, if uh, so, for example, I, I will give you uh, an example in uh, Vietnam. We supported uh, through about uh, uh, seventy-eight million dollar project on strengthening the agricultural science and technology at uh, Vietnamese uh, agricultural un universities and uh, agricultural institutions. So these, uh, that $80 million is for promoting research and also, of course, also to build infrastructure uh, in terms of agricultural universities, et cetera, research institutions and all that. So the, uh, the thing is that uh, uh, it could be also in the form of grant sometime, I mean, and also loan. If it is infrastructure, it is usually loan. If it is uh, pure research, it will be in the form of uh, grants, etc. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Bujang Rao Garu. Uh, Srinivasan. Yes, Srinivasan. thank you. Uh, Srinivasan, nice, nice hearing you. And, uh, some of our classmates also in this session. Uh, hello, uh, one thing I want to ask uh, Srinivasan. Uh, 50 percent we have to increase the production by 50 and also that's climate uh, change we have to combat uh, another 25 percent means 75 percent we have to increase the production by uh, 2050 but uh, present uh, scenario in uh, ap government lo chuste, we are uh, uh, now they are all uh, uh, advising not to go for uh, food production uh, especially rice and all so, Mano Atlas or Aldini, how we have to uh, see? Yeah. It's a good question. I mean, for the benefit of everyone, I will speak in English. I mean, because maybe I see some names uh, from other, other regions. I think that's a very important question. How do we balance uh, the issues of productivity uh, and also value? I think the why people are asking us to not to focus on productivity or just increasing yields is basically farmers are not getting right prices for the produce. So that is the major concern. And people want uh, uh, our farmers to shift from uh, traditional food crops to high value crops, whether it is fruits, vegetables, or uh, uh, other commercial crops, uh, uh, spices, and whatever. So the intention there is basically to increase the incomes, I mean, which is very important. But at the same time, I mean, unless the consumer food habits are going to change rapid, I mean, drastically, of course, consumer habits are changing either because of diseases. For example, now uh, India is known to be capital of diabetics, uh, uh, for example. And it's going to uh, always, I mean, there will be increasing need for other uh, commodities, whether it is vegetables or fruits, or even um, animal protein, uh, et cetera. So already we are seeing the uh, trend actually. And also with increasing incomes, both in rural and uh, urban areas, uh, we also are going to see tremendous change in the consumer uh, preferences uh, for different types of foods rather than traditional uh, rice-based uh, rice uh, diets. So that is why, I mean, we need to really look at, I mean, what are the key challenges for the rice value chains currently? How do we really bring about value addition rather than just purely focusing on production? That's what I am trying to mention. I think we have not really harnessed various value addition opportunities, even for rice. If you look at Japan, if you look at Thailand or other things, so for, from rice itself, there are, they are making more than 70 to 80 products. Uh, of course, I mean, it doesn't mean that uh, India does not have the diversity. We also have. But in terms of value addition opportunities, we are not doing adequately, even for a traditional crop like rice. But more importantly, I mean, we need to look at all crops. And rather than pure production, we need to look at that uh, post-harvest and value chain and value addition opportunities. And the, uh, the more importantly, even the produced crops also, we are, there is a tremendous loss. Uh, that is why, I mean, even in rice also, 
because of uh, vagaries of nature, etc. How many people are really losing, I mean, even before harvesting uh, rice? So the, the question is that uh, what measures are there? I mean, so just uh, focusing on production alone is not going to be solution. But uh, if, we can, if we can preserve what we can produce, that itself will be the major achievement, actually, when we say in terms of meeting the food needs. So, yeah, that's what I would like to say for now. Thanks. Anja, I am uh, from TS Irrigation. I am your classmate, first batch APRJC. <laughs> yes. So, uh, the, I want to know what is the effect on, because I am, uh, I belongs to this water bodies and the water, uh, the water development resources. What is the climate change on these water bodies and how to improve them and how to protect them and how to update them? Yeah, thank you for asking that important question. I mean, basically what all impacts of climate change are mediated through water, whether it is in the form of floods, droughts, or sea level rise, or even uh, cyclones, typhoons, everything is mediated through water. And definitely in countries like India, we are going to face uh, much, uh, I mean, more water stress. And definitely uh, we will need to, uh, first of all, we need to make changes in terms of uh, crops that we want to grow. Uh, we, will, we will have increasing competition from urbanization. We are already facing that. We will have more competition for industrialization. I mean, industries need, will also need a lot of water. Even for food processing also, there will be a lot of water. So actually the uh, World Resources Institute and HSBC have done a joint study on food and beverage industry in Asia and particularly India, for example. So there will be so many, I mean, we know the examples of Coca-Cola, uh, I would say uh, Coca-Cola related thing in uh, Kerala, for example. They are, uh, the, uh, the criticism is that they are exploiting the groundwater unsustainably uh, for their Coca-Cola plants. And it induced them to really look at uh, how they, they should protect the forests and also watersheds. So the thing is that uh, climate change impacts on water and water resource management are going to be very serious. So we need to really look at how we are going to allocate water for various sectors, uh, whether it is agriculture, urbanization, industrialization, that is at a macro scale. And within agriculture also, how do we produce more food per, uh, per drop of water? I mean, and also whether we need to change, change the crops, whether we need to um, really look at water uh, use efficiency measures. For example, uh, we have several irrigation schemes uh, that ADB is supporting. Uh, we are looking at multiple options. How do we reduce these water losses? Uh, even, uh, even in crops, uh, I mean, can, can we think of more sprinkler or drip irrigation based systems? Because they, simply there will not be enough water if we really want to continue the same methods. So we need to have advanced methods. We need to introduce digitization, et cetera, to improve efficiency in water management. And also even reservoir storage, reservoir management, uh, irrigation, uh, water allocation. We really need more innovations. I mean, uh, this is an urgent task. Otherwise, uh, the estimate is, again, if we continue the business as usual, it is likely that almost uh, two to three point, uh, 3.5 crores or 35 million people may have to uh, totally migrate uh, from, from these uh, uh, water stressed areas. So that is the expectation by even 2050. So th there, these are the challenges that uh, we need to consider. Within agribusiness value chains, we really need to look at uh, how to improve water use efficiency. Uh, very carefully along the value chain, not only for crop production, but also for the post-harvest processing and other operations. Uh, we can discuss more, I mean, but that is an important challenge. Thank you, sir. Uh, last one or two queries from the participants. Sheshu Madhav, sir. Yeah, uh, sir, I am, I am Sheshu Madhav from Rice Research Institute. 
the topic is so interesting i mean the climate change and valuation in relation to the rice which you are telling uh, it's very pertinent to our institute but my query is that in india value addition the chains are not well established what kind of need and what kind of transformation is required to make this value chain uh, models to operate although we have a technologies we have although i mean the companies are working for value addition in case of rice but not working efficiently like what you said in a, some case studies what kind of transformations needed thank you yeah thank you i mean i, I think i briefly touched upon because of lack of time i did not elaborate i believe the transformations are fourfold one is institutional transformation what type of institutions are we talking about a, a, along the value chain is it in terms of research institutions is it in terms of policy bodies or is it in terms of agri businesses so what type of transformations are required to make them interested and support the value addition opportunities etc second is policies do we have a, a agri business policy do we have agri business policy that that addresses uh, climate concerns that addresses consumer concerns that addresses producer concerns effectively so what type of policy innovations are required third area is technologies again i mean uh, how do we really look at this uh, whole rice uh, rice based value chains what type of technologies i mean in production wise i think we are more or less uh, actually as good as any other country but uh, the again after production or even in terms of prevention of the losses from production are we good at it what technologies can be really looked at uh, and in terms of processing and value addition and etc fourth and most important thing is behavioral change so the behavior of the consumers behavior of the producers behavior of the uh, you know all the uh, stakeholders along the value chain including the agri businesses so how do we motivate them not to waste for example we you know we, uh, you know better than i do in terms of for example now in china they mentioned that if you go to a restaurant and waste you need to pay extra money so can we impose that type of things how much waste is going on in our restaurants for example i mean i i'm just taking as an example so this needs a behavioral change on the part of consumers you may be able to afford but you have no right to waste so the, the that is same thing in germany also they are taxing actually if you waste food so so the, the question is that how do we really uh, bring the transformation in the consumer behavior uh, in terms of wastage or in terms of even value addition also so these are some of the things i mean it's not only the researchers that uh, that can help i mean it is across this whole spec spectrum of the stakeholders uh, that is why i believe um, i i think uh, although i am not up to date in terms of uh, agri business policy in rice uh, in india i think this is one area where you can really look at i mean what policy innovations can be created what technologies are there what can be what else can be done by looking at other countries and also especially behavior i think these are some of the things that uh, we can look at thank you sir i have a question to ask yeah please so i am uh, uh, from national dairy development board working in uh, telangana sir as you said because of government efforts are good irrigation facilities available for the last of cup last couple of years the rice production has gone up tremendously and the government has put a ban on the farmers to not to go for rice this is the situation here even you were looking at the 2050 also i think we we have we have reached to that level in terms of productivity yeah i can say that because of good varieties available good irrigation facilities and efforts of the government for irrigation projects all those things so how we can see this one as you said uh, the value addition there are plenty of opportunities for value addition but uh, but uh, the governments or ngos are for that sake anybody is not looking at that 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 point of so this has to be looked into so that the whatever uh, consumer rupee 
creator goes to the producer. Yeah, I agree with you. It is not the again. I mean, yeah, but uh, we should really, really look at actually. When you say that uh, our production is enough for even 2050, you see, I mean, uh, uh, we all know that the currently even global production or even national production production itself may be enough if it is equally distributed. But uh, as you can see, 17 percent of the Indian population is not getting enough food. It is almost one fifth. When we say we have production to meet 2050, and at the same time, we say 20% of the people don't have enough food, there are two diverse situations. So we need to really look at uh, at two levels. One is at local level. So if there is an excess production, as you rightly agreed with what I was saying, that we need to improve the value addition opportunities so that the whatever whatever rice that was produced doesn't go waste. You may be producing this season, but if it is not stored well, if it is not processed well, by next season, it is as good as not producing if it gets wasted. So, I mean, I think the focusing on production alone is not the solution. We should move beyond that. I think that is, that is the point you also agree. So, but what I would like to say is that even production alone is not going to be sufficient. We are still seeing one fifth of the population doesn't have enough food, enough food. So the, the, this is the dilemma that we are continuing to face. And uh, overall production also, I mean, uh, I know definitely, you know better than me, uh, you look at China versus India. China has almost one third of our agricultural area and they are producing three times more than us and still they are importing. Of course, they are more non-vegetarian and they want to uh, put their uh, food more as a livestock feed, etc. But importantly, when you say that we are already producing more, we are already uh, uh, producing even to 2050, uh, that may be a bit uh, exaggerated claim in my opinion. So the point is that uh, I think on the point of value addition, we are all, we are thinking alike. And we need to focus more on reducing wastage on whatever is produced and increasing the value so that uh, definitely farmer gets the benefit out of most benefit out of the consumer's rupee. Yeah. Sir, as you said, 17% of population is starved. But on the other hand, the food production, whatever is being stored at the FCI and other godowns, it is going wasted, which can meet even. 20% 20, 20 of the population. Sure. Yeah, it is not because of less production. It is because of uh, lack of proper storage facilities and government policies per se. In my opinion, it is not because of less production. Starvation is not due to less production. It is because of government policies as well as the storage, poor storage facilities. How much food grain is wasted, sir, in FCA codons? Sure. I agree with you. Oh, sir, uh, next to Ramesh Babu, sir. Uh, thank you, madam. And uh, uh, Srinivas, how are you? Sure, uh, thank you. Dr. Ramesh, you are senior. <laughs> yeah, after retirement, now I am working with the Vijnan University as director in the agriculture. Very nice. We started agriculture basic course. So I'll come back to my question. Uh, it is related to agriculture. Uh, ours is a coastal plain system, coastal ecosystem, Andhra Pradesh. I am talking to because out of 15 agroclimatic zones, ours fall under the South Plateau and the Hill Sea, which is more vulnerable to climate change in my perception. And uh, another important point is our 80% of the farmers are, uh, I mean, uh, low farm, I mean, uh, holding point of view, they are small farm holders. So, really, I mean, uh, do you suggest any long term uh, concrete protocols? Uh, to address the I mean, the climate change, to mitigate the climate change and the climate resilient agriculture aspects. Uh, this is most important, particularly for adoption fund. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That is a continuous challenge. I mean, uh, there are, uh, again, I mean, we need to look at holistically uh, rather than only looking at either production or something. I want to look at the uh, whole value chain. Uh, so where are the climate risks affecting along the value chain, right from production all the way to trading and marketing and uh, uh, reaching the consumer? So there are so many opportunities, I believe, 
even with the current uh, production capacities. So if we focus more on value addition, definitely the farmer can get a better, better value for his uh, produce. So if the incomes are increased through value addition, and I think that itself will increase their adaptive capacity to impacts of climate change. So without improving their adaptive capacity, either in terms of income levels or skills or uh, you know, overall institutions that support them, we cannot make further progress. Currently, we believe that still our support to farmers uh, is still uh, at very low level as compared with, I mean, uh, I mean, I have visited around 62 countries and we we'll look at, when we look at the support to farmers, both in developed countries and developing countries, I personally feel that there are many areas where it's not only the governments. I mean, again, we need to look at the whole, uh, whole range of stakeholders, governments, development partners, private sector, everybody. They need to support our farmers. And there are many opportunities which are being ignored uh, because of the so-called uh, race to earn money uh, in a short time. So everybody is uh, trying to cut corners, whether it is private agribusinesses or, uh, so the, the thing is that this is where uh, we need a collective thinking. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, uh, as compared with some other countries, we do not have enough uh, discussions between the government and the private sector, uh, enough discussions between the government and the academia. Uh, research community, for example. Uh, so the research community, whatever they are working hard and producing as papers, they remain as papers. They don't translate into action. Uh, so the, the thing is that uh, there is more to be done. Although we do have, our universities have good research extension and training functions, uh, but, the, but, uh, but, but that is... Um, uh, that is not uh, happening. I mean, uh, this is something that uh, we need to do uh, sort of more efficiently. Yeah. Anja? Yes, oh, please. Man. No, I mean, I, I think uh, another person is waiting, Ramana. Yes, sir. Another Last person. question from Thank you, Sai, you, sir. Thank you madam. Uh, Srinivasan, uh, you have given a good uh, information about it, and we are uh, always. Uh, projecting that in 2030 and 2050, this may be occurring. Yes, I want to know that what is the actual uh, involvement of this ADB with uh, any of the organizations in India, like ICR or other things, to reduce the climate change effect in any particular present situation, how it is affecting? That's my... Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah, there any you. projects with ICR, with ADB, to reduce the climate effect on... Uh, Mm. I mean, I partially answered that question before because somebody also asked. Basically, whatever ADB requests, ADB is owned by the governments, including government of India. So any assistance to a particular country is at the request of the government or at the request of a private company that wants to borrow from ADB. So the, the question is that... Uh, the institutions like ICR, which are primarily on this, of course, I know that they are also in education and training and uh, extension, but uh, they are primary. So if there is a request from ICR that goes to uh, government of India and government of India requests ADB for assistance, that is quite possible. But so in India, so the common know what is the present status, whether there is any project running with ICR or not. Yes. No, I mean, uh, okay, that's a good question. I mean, uh, uh, the thing is that the ICR institutes are involved in implementing certain ADB projects. Uh, so, the, for example, I mean, in Karnataka or in Maharashtra, I know that uh, some ICR institutes are involved. But what is happening is, for example, this Maharashtra Agribusiness Network project. So that is a huge project of more than $150 million or something. So out of that $150 million, the research component may be, I don't know the exact number because I'm not directly handling that project because I am mostly working for Southeast Asia, not for South Asia. So maybe one or $2 million may be there, 
that get diverted to or that gets allocated to a particular research institution or extension body or etc so the that depends on the design of the project all icr institutes can really collaborate with this for example adb is providing almost 3 to 4 billion dollars per year of assistance uh, to india of course i mean some are in transport highways uh, metros and multiple things and in agriculture sector maybe the 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 amount may be around 300 500 million dollars i mean it may not be much but uh, but but still out of the 300 to 500 million also there are opportunities so, so um, there are two ways to go about one is to look at what are the if you just do a google search adb agriculture projects in india you will get a range of projects maybe at least 10 12 projects and where are they located so if you look at it uh, the usually they are in maharashtra gujarat uh, um, i mean madhya pradesh uh, um, bihar and also arunachal pradesh etc why they are not so many in andhra pradesh or telangana it all i mean again it depends i mean maybe the governments are hesitant to um, request adb for assistance or something or maybe uh, there are many opportunities that are lost because uh, there have been some examples where i asked or uh, where i provided some information but uh, still people could not act on it so for example in case of hurricane uh, when we had this uh, in visakhapatnam there was a big typhoon hudhud uh, hudhud so at that time we were ready, i mean there was a willingness to provide almost 120 crores as a, simply as a grant but there must be a letter of request uh, that must come within one month of the event but uh, our government could not uh, deliver that one one page letter in one month time so obviously that opportunity was lost so i mean this is just an example but w- what i am trying to say is i think it, it comes i mean we need a better coordination definitely research institutes can benefit and other countries are benefiting thank you sir thank you sir uh, time constraint is there so now i request our director sir to give his remarks uh, thank you very much uh, first of all uh, let me uh, appreciate and also thank uh, our uh, honorable speaker today uh, dr ancha srinivasan who has made uh, excellent presentation on the very important issue that is uh, agri business uh, agri business value chains in changing climate and uh, we all know that uh, this uh, subject has become household uh, uh, talk like uh, in uh, beat in national regional or local level wherever we discuss without uh, referring to climate change uh, any issue any issue that is being discussed in relation to agriculture uh, and nowadays has become incomplete so the issue chosen uh, for talk is very important and uh, is the one uh i think uh, today uh, the kind of uh, uh, the queries that followed after like uh, followed the lecture clearly test, uh, testify that uh, his presentation has covered uh, multitude uh, aspects of um, the whole issue and it's a very complex issue we all understand this uh, because uh, the, the the agriculture uh, in a way contributes to climate change through global warming and all and uh, climate uh, change really impacts the agriculture to a great extent so they are uh, both of them are uh, intricately linked actually and uh, we can't separate one another uh, to deal uh, separately like so whatever we talk about the climate uh, changes that are taking place now it has become a reality and everybody uh, sees it uh, as is reflected uh, in the extreme weather events that we experience in our uh, Uh, systems uh, country specific uh, uh, impacts are also uh, recorded uh, as uh, uh, dr srinivasan uh, said uh, with a small change uh, in the temperature maybe a small rise maybe 0.5 of a degree rise in temperature also is going to create a big impact on the production systems across the nations and the impacts are going to be uh, different across the different uh, uh, regions Uh, uh, and because vulnerabilities of the agriculture production systems are also different um, and uh, the kind of strategies that we would like to develop uh, 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 in terms of uh, transformations that are needed 
uh, in the whole management of the production systems, be it uh, controlling the increasing the productivity. Uh, some people may agree that we need to uh, step up the productivity, but uh, but there is a point uh, when we say that uh, uh, the the largest losses need to be minimized, and also the wasted food need to be curtailed. Uh, these two things uh, need to be addressed, uh, uh, and with, they are within our control. Uh, unlike uh, unlike the, the 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 target for increasing the productivity, probably. Uh, we can only address the issue halfway, not uh, in total, because the climate change is going to take place and it's going to happen uh, no matter how much uh, effort you put in, how much uh, uh, the, the funding uh, or investments that you, you, you put into the system. Climate change is, is bound to happen and it, it continues to take place. So in the context of uh, this uh, uh, very complex uh, changes that we, we, we are uh, going through, uh, probably the lecture that he has delivered today, and he has uh, put in uh, put forth few uh, takeaways, and they are really excellent. I am amazed to see, see he, he, by putting five points, he, he covered the whole range of uh, the issues involved in climate change and agriculture production systems, management of the food uh, food chains. Everything has been covered, sir. Uh, because of the uh, paucity of the time. Uh, probably we have already uh, running late actually uh, by the um, uh, schedule time was only up to 12 but now uh, because of some technical issues and also the kind of interest that uh, participants exhibited uh, uh, probably they have uh, uh, they have got a lot of queries uh, uh, from the chat box i can see a lot many questions are being raised and when questions are raised we can understand that uh, they are uh, very much involved in the talk and that is that that uh, involvement uh, creation of that kind of involvement among the audience uh, definitely it is a credit to the speaker thank you very much sir for having given us an excellent uh, talk uh, and uh, this is a befitting talk uh, maybe uh, we are organizing a series of lectures uh, in connection with the ajadi ka amrit mahotsav uh, to commemorate the 75 years of india's independence so your lecture uh, is definitely, I read it is the, as the best one because it has covered the most important uh, talk to, uh, topic. And uh, we look forward to hear you uh, even in future also. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you once again. Thank you very much once again for the opportunity. And I really enjoyed uh, uh, the conversations and also the chat uh, list also. I mean, basically, I'm sorry for the inconvenience caused due to the network issues, uh, which is beyond my control. But uh, I thank you for your understanding and also for this opportunity. Thank you all so much. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. C. Chandrasekhar Rao, sir, head in charge division of crop chemistry and soil science to propose formal out of thanks. Thank you very much, sir. I'm very happy to see you after a long time, uh, Mr. Srinivasan, sir. On behalf of the director of CTRI, on behalf of the scientists of the CTRI, uh, I'm very much thankful to you, sir, for accepting our uh, invitation to deliver the lecture on agribusiness value chain in the changing climate. And your elaborate and thought-provoking lecture will really help the uh, scientists across the country to orient their research efforts towards <coughs> the mitigation of the climate change effects, sir. I'm thankful to all the ICR officials, the scientists from um, the different institutes, heads of the divisions, and the, all the participants who participated and made this particular um, uh, lecture very lively. And uh, I'm thanked to the director and for his support in, and guidance in organizing this lecture. Once again, I thank you one and all for making this particular uh, lecture very, uh, very effective and uh, success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you.